Welcome, Jason. Well, thank you very much, and thank you in advance for listening to the, the third male in a suit and a tie on a Saturday morning. I may have to whistle through some of these slides so that you don't miss uh, a caffeine injection, which I know will be very necessary by the time that I'm finished. Uh, but if we don't get time for Q&A, I will hang around over coffee so you can ask me questions I may be able to answer, and some uh, that I may not be able to answer just yet. That said, we know that the consultation is finished, we know the new handbooks are out there, we know the new framework is out there. Um, it will be part of my summer reading, it may not necessarily be part of yours. So what I'll try and focus in on in the next 20 minutes or so are the kinds of questions inspectors might ask governors and the kind of questions that governors might ask school leaders before Ofsted ever come close to the building. And a note of cautious optimism I think, before I go to my first slide. I very much doubt that there's going to be a sea change required in the way governors work, the way governors support, the way governors challenge, and the way governors respond to people like me during inspection. Uh, because fundamentally, really, uh, the framework, uh, hopefully, will continue to uh, test those kinds of things that governors spend an awful lot of time uh, looking at and focusing on. And let's just bust the first myth that might be out there already, which is that there is a preferred style of curriculum, because we know the new framework is very largely about the curriculum. There isn't. Uh, if you follow the national curriculum and you follow it well and it meets the needs of learners, that's absolutely fine. If you do something different, uh, then of course we will look at that and the test will be whether it works, whether it meets the needs of different groups of, of pupils. Um, and fulfills the kinds of things that you might expect a curriculum to uh, fulfill. Our working definition of a curriculum won't be a surprise to any of you, so I won't labour anything with that particular slide, but you will, if you haven't already, become aware of the first buzz phrase for a new framework. And that is, around the curriculum, what's the intent behind it? Uh, how is it implemented on the ground by teachers? Uh, and others in schools, and what is the impact of the curriculum that leaders have put in place. And if much of the new quality of education grade will be determined by inspectors' assessment of those three I's, then, of course, as governors, you will, as you always have been, uh, be asking periodically about those three I's long before people like me enter the building. Why have we changed things? Again, I won't uh, labour this, but we've heard about data from two of our speakers already. Data is important. It raises great questions. It's helpful uh, for governors. It's helpful for teachers if it's used in the right way. But on inspection, it's sometimes been the case that inspectors sit and have interviews with people about data, and they look at numbers on a page, and the numbers on a page might well be accurate, but it's really difficult, given the constraints on inspection, to get behind the numbers on the page, to test the validity of the numbers that you're being given. And it must be, or it should be, even more useful on inspection to actually look at the way that the curriculum is implemented and to spend less time in meetings with senior leaders looking at numbers on pages. So the separate outcomes grade, as you will all know by now, goes and any conversation about how well pupils are doing uh, will be accounted for within the overall quality of education uh, grade. And you might like to ask as governors, how do we know that the curriculum is actually facilitating pupils' learning? Uh, to quote uh, from the uh, text that I referenced there, learning is defined as an alteration in long-term memory. If nothing has altered in long-term memory, nothing has been learned, as I found to my cost at biology O-level time, where one of the papers went spectacularly badly, because frankly, before the exam, nothing, for reasons entirely due to my own idleness at that point, had <laughs> transferred itself into my long-term memory. Uh, but enough personal revelations. <laughs> more seriously, more seriously, and I'm sure we all know this language deficit, Another question you might want to ask of governors, particularly in secondaries, 
where this hasn't always been as big a focus, uh, that is reading, uh, as it has rightly in primaries, is what are leaders doing to ensure that this language deficit is tackled? We know that if you are in a family receiving welfare, by the time you are four years old, you will have heard cumulatively 13 million words. If you're in a professional family, by your fourth birthday, it will be 45 million words. It's a staggering difference, and schools have a huge job to do to try to close that gap or diminish that difference. And we know the importance of reading here in this respect. We know that most vocab, most new words are encountered by reading them in text rather than by hearing them. And we also know, uh, particularly secondary colleagues in the room will know, just how language light very many GCSE texts are. So a good question for governors to keep asking, particularly at secondary level, is how far are we making sure as a school that the pupils are being exposed to texts with sufficiently demanding vocabulary so that they can grow their vocabulary and eventually, if they go on to A-level or further study, actually engage with high-level and demanding text. It's not been a great focus on inspection in secondary. Uh, perhaps it should have been. I think that will change. And when I was driving here, up until the last mile or so, I could think about all manner of things. My inspection next week, um, what I need to buy when I go shopping this evening, and various other excitements like that. Um, until about the last mile or so. And I was able to do that because of another Ofsted buzzword that will enter the vocabulary. And that is automaticity. And I'm really glad I didn't trip over that word, so I'll say it again, automaticity. If I keep saying it, I'll say it automatically when I need to in schools. My driving is automatic. I'm not saying it's particularly good, um, but I'm so used to doing it, I don't need to think about it. So I can get to the end of a journey and think, I don't remember anything about that journey, uh, but I have written my inspection report in my head on the way home from a school. So my learning, in terms of driving, is so automatic that I can do other stuff while I'm doing it. And one of the things we'll be looking for on inspection is how far pupils learning reaches that automaticity, got it wrong, I'll try it again, that automaticity standard. I.e., in mathematics, if you have a great command of times tables and basic number operations, uh, you can apply that knowledge quite readily and quite quickly to real world problems and to reasoning <coughs> activities. If you have to get your calculator out, take your socks and shoes off um, to do the really basic stuff, then you're not likely to be able to apply that knowledge particularly fluently. And on inspection then, we're going to be looking at how well teachers ensure that pupils have that working knowledge they need in their heads to be able to do things with what they know in a fluent way. And Another buzzword that we'll be looking out for on inspection is the last two on that slide. At some point during year nine, I caught glandular fever. I can see the sympathetic faces amongst the audience. I was off school for two weeks. During that fortnight, we did something to do with equations in mathematics. When I returned to school, nobody thought I might need to catch up with the equations work, and so I struggled and staggered my way through to an eventual C grade pass at maths O level. Not a great achievement, but a pretty good achievement back then if you didn't really know anything about algebra. So one of the things we'll be looking at is how the schools via assessment, and I don't just mean tests, although those are important, how the schools via assessment, it's a question you might want to ask as governors, <coughs> work out the gaps that pupils have in their knowledge and do something to fill those gaps and therefore avoid that cumulative disfluency uh, that if you're a secondary colleague often means endless <coughs> intervention at the back end of key stage four. Perhaps if you're a primary colleague it means endless intervention pre-SATS uh, because people simply haven't learned things in the first place. So we'll be on the lookout for, for that one. And 
in terms of other new inspection jargon phrases, uh, the middle of the slide indicates how it will often work on a Section 5 or a Section 8 inspection. But I'll start with the left-hand side. So we'll start first thing uh, in the initial telephone call and then first thing in the morning asking leaders what their rationale for the curriculum is. Pure and simple. What is it? How do you implement it? How effectively do you think you manage that? So we get that top level view and then we will conduct a series of deep dives in uh, subject areas. And the idea is that we capture a range of evidence from different sources and thread that together in perhaps four or five key subject areas on a full inspection. And that will give us a really good indication of the quality of education. We'll bring all those things together and other inspection work as well and come up with our final judgments. So what does a deep dive actually look like in practice? I'll come on to that uh, very, very shortly. But you may want to, as governors, uh, prepare for the kinds of questions that are likely to be asked to school leaders. And we haven't got a template, we haven't got a script, so the bullet points that exist on these slides are not things that inspectors will, will read off and definitely ask on inspection. But you would be surprised, wouldn't you, if people like me didn't ask questions like, what are the principles behind your curriculum? How do you implement it? How do you make sure pupils build on their prior knowledge and how do you make sure that pupils are able to retrieve what they know so that they can use that knowledge and apply it to the next stage in their learning or to the next problem to be solved? These are not particularly uh, difficult questions to ask, I think, of school leaders who live this stuff uh, day in, day out. What else might we do or what else will we do? Well, we'll talk to, to a far greater extent, subject leaders than perhaps we do <coughs> at present on inspection. If we're carrying out a deep dive into a subject, we will talk to senior leaders about that subject, talk to subject leaders about the aims, the implementation, and the impact, look at learning within that subject, both in lessons and in pupils' books on an overtime basis, talk to pupils, whose lessons we've been in, so we can get behind, well, what did you learn? How did that build on what you previously knew? How did teachers help you remember? All of those kinds of questions. And of course, asking governors about impact. And if it's been the case in many inspections, in primary in particular, that inspectors have typically majored on English and mathematics, um, phonics, maybe a bit of early years, and haven't asked too many questions about history, geography, other foundation subjects, expect that to change. As has been rightly said earlier this morning uh, by previous speakers, we are looking much more holistically at the curriculum now. And if it was ever good enough to be really great in English and maths, but to not be great at other things, then times have changed. And we recognise the pressures there, particularly in small primary schools where uh, there may not be a vast amount of leadership capacity in terms of the number of leaders who are present in the building. So if you're not there with your curriculum in certain areas yet, the new handbook makes it really clear. Uh, for about a, a year or so, inspectors will tend to be generous to you if you know that you're not there in a particular subject area, and you have clear plans in place to improve provision, and there's some evidence of impact towards those. And the reason for mentioning that is that it's a very normal human response to inspection, and I've been on every side of the fence, including sat on it. It's a very <laughs> normal human response to inspection to want to not talk about things that aren't quite there yet, and to just be really clear about everything that works really well. It will be better on inspection if you know something isn't where you want it to be, to be really clear about that from the off, particularly as this new framework uh, beds in. So deep dives then, just to 
to reiterate the importance of these on inspection. And they may have, well this methodology may have implications for the way governors want to do their own uh, drop-ins, monitoring school visits. That's entirely up to governors and schools how they do those. There's no Ofsted preferred style to how those will work. But essentially what we're trying to do is to get away from inspection that's about data and about a series of brief dips into generic pedagogy within lessons. At the moment, a lot of what we do on inspection is dipping into large numbers of lessons, forming an overview about strengths and weaknesses of teaching and what we see, cross-referencing with what's in books, and having a look at leaders' data. Generic pedagogy isn't unimportant, um, and there is a place for that. Of course there is. But much richer, we think, it will be, and I think the pilots have uh, made this evident, to really thread the evidence together in a way that doing the things on this slide will hopefully uh, do. And if we need to deep dive further on a second day of inspection, whether it's a short or whether it's a section five, because what we see doesn't match what leaders see, then there is the flexibility to do just that. You may be thinking at the moment, when's it going to stop? Um, and that's in a few minutes time. You may also be thinking, well, okay, that's great in terms of deep dives and four or five subjects. What about everything else the school does? Are inspectors not going to look at other aspects of the school's work? Well, yes, we will. We will broaden out beyond those key subjects that we choose to look at uh, by doing the kinds of things that inspectors currently do. So it shouldn't be the case that in a Section 5 inspection, you get to the end of it and inspectors have only sampled learning within four or five subject areas. It may be the case if that inspection requires that particular focus, but it shouldn't be in the generality of inspections that we do. So questions that we might ask or you might ask about curriculum quality that first point beneath implementation, I imagine, is going to come up a lot. How far does your curriculum ensure that pupils actually remember the stuff? <coughs> not five minutes after the lesson, not one week after the lesson, but a month later, six months later. And how do you use assessment to actually support that pushing of things into long-term memory? We all complain about tests. I've probably taken more tests than most people. Um, we all complain about them. We all complain about the testing effect, the stress on young people. And there is a case for that complaint. Of course there is. However, we know that there is a testing effect. Research tells us that if you periodically test pupils on knowledge, it doesn't have to be by an, ex by an exam, it could be by any number of means, the more regularly you do that, the practice they engage in, in terms of revising, trying to learn the stuff, trying to pull it out of their brains, trying to tell it to the teacher or write it down, over time increases the amount that they can remember. We all know this, this is not news. We didn't need academics to tell us that that's the way we learn things and get them in a long-term memory. But we may well ask on inspection, how does assessment facilitate that? Um, in the past, mea culpa perhaps, uh, when inspectors have gone into classrooms, sometimes they'll look at an activity and they may have said, well, that wasn't very challenging. It was a quick quiz. It was a word search. It was a hands up if you can tell me the answer to this. How did that stretch the most, eh? What we're trying to do with the new framework is to get away from trying to make judgments based on a decontextualized 20 minute dip into some learning, and rightly so. So when we're observing learning, we want to know where does that lesson or where does that activity sit within a sequence, within the curriculum. So if you're a teacher during an inspection and you do want to promote that automaticity, you do want to help pupils to remember things so they can build on that learning. And in that lesson, there is a 15 minute knowledge test you should not 
refuse to do that because people like me are in the building. If you would have done that anyway, and that makes sense in terms of your assessment, then do it. That's absolutely fine. Clearly, if we went into every single lesson over two days, all we saw was young people doing endless factual knowledge recall tests, we might have some questions to ask about that uh, and the typicality of it, but that's pretty unlikely. I talked about summer reading slightly facetiously uh, earlier. What I would say is, and I'd say this to school leaders as well as governors, is that if you get time to look at just one piece of Ofsted published material this summer, when you're on the beach with nothing better to do, the one I'd advise you to look at, it's on, it's on the line, it's out there, is the Education Inspection Framework Overview of Research, January 2019. Snap your title, that one. You just want to go into a bookshop and say, hey, have you got that? Because I want it now. You know, you want it on Amazon, quick delivery, via drone, whatever it might be. No need to do that, put it into Google, there it is. It actually goes through all of the research that underpins the new framework. Uh, not our research, but research from academics nationally and internationally. And in summary form, it takes us through, well, what does good teaching tend to look like? What's it often characterised by? Uh, what's effective curriculum planning tend to look like? What's really good behaviour management? Um, attendance work, and so on. How are those things typically characterised in schools? And as a resource for governors, when you're listening to senior leaders talk about how they do things, uh, it may well be worth a read, because you can compare what you're hearing with what we know internationally has a lot of impact. Senior leaders, doubtless, will know all of that stuff anyway. I won't labour that particular slide because we're five minutes away from coffee, uh, but the key point in it is, of course, that that outcomes judgment goes. We no longer have that lengthy data meeting when we're on uh, inspection. I will no longer have to write 12, 13 bullet points in a Section 5 inspection report on pupils' outcomes. It's subsumed into the quality of education judgment. And there are one or two bullets about outcomes and progress in there, and the rest of it's really all about how you get those progress and outcomes measures that you get. So there is a shift of focus. Does it mean that pupils' progress and outcomes are unimportant? Now, of course it doesn't. It's unlikely we would go into a school and say, well, you've got a fabulous curriculum, but year after year after year, pupils don't get the currency they need to go off and be successful in the next stage. Um, that might prompt some questions about just how fabulously the curriculum is actually implemented. Uh, but it is worth being aware, uh, as governors, of that shift, that outcomes grade goes. Just briefly on safeguarding, and um, really this slide is there in the, the handbook in one of the great descriptors, um, governors probably ask those identify, help and manage questions. Um, I doubt that any of that is new, frankly. Do all governors know the answers? And the reason that I, I ask that is because sometimes on inspection we are told the safeguarding governor isn't here today, so we can't really tell you anything about safeguarding. Well. I'm sorry, but you need to be able to tell us something about safeguarding, even if there is a designated safeguarding governor, not statutory, but advisory, and that person can't be present on inspection. So if you have a mechanism whereby the safeguarding guru can enlighten other governors from time to time about standards <coughs> in those respects, that is all to the good. But essentially, is your role as governor something that has to change because we're changing the way we do things? No, absolutely not. Uh, are we going to change the way we ask about governance? Well, yes, we are. And it comes back to Tim's point, which is that sometimes inspectors don't really know enough about the context of governance in the institution that they inspect because things are much more complicated now than they used to be. In a standalone academy, we're going to be asked to speak to one or more trustees. Um, if you're in a multi academy trust, then we are going to ask, if we haven't been already, frankly we should have been, we're going to ask, right, okay, 
what powers are delegated to you by the map and which remain at a higher level with the Board of Trustees. And we will ask to speak to local governing board members and trustees as well. And that hasn't always happened uh, in the past. Penultimate bullet point is really, really important. Can't stress this enough. I've been doing a lot of work on pupil movement outside of normal transfer times, particularly at secondary, when I've been inspecting in the last few months or so. Uh, i.e. pupils leaving other than the usual transfer times. Sometimes that is movement and it's in the best interest of young people. Sometimes it may be off-rolling, i.e. getting people off the books so they don't impact on one's progress at eight scores, he said, speaking bluntly. And it's a challenge on inspection to try and work out the one from the other and to keep an open mind. On inspection, the key is, are the reasons for pupil movements when they happen, in the best interests of those young people concerned? And can the school demonstrate that? Or are pupils being moved out of the school's provision because frankly, they are a nuisance and they're not likely to do very well? That isn't obviously okay. So, from time to time, um, from time to time, we would expect to see in Governor's Minutes Governors being aware of the reasons for any abnormal pupil movement and leaders to be sharing an analysis of those reasons with governors. So not just X pupils left the school, X pupils joined, but these are the trends in terms of uh, pupils of different ability levels or send or disadvantage or behaviour or attendance or whatever it might be that leaders can slice and dice that data with. This is what it's telling us about the quality of our provision, and these are the questions we might want to raise and discuss, given that so many of these pupils are leaving, and we don't necessarily want them to go in that scenario. So, new sub bullet in inadequate, don't want to scare you, but <coughs> hasn't been there previously. If governors haven't got a handle on this, and it's an issue, we're going to probe a lot, a lot on that. And also, another one we haven't historically done unless we've really found there might be an issue on inspection, we will look at any use of inaccurate registration codes, attendance codes, that might be uh, indicative of some practice going on that is not what it ought to be. Almost there, he said, to give his audience hope. Talked about the deep dives. Primary section fives, reading will always be a focus. Maths will often be, and one or more of the foundation subjects will be as well. Um, and in the past, leaders have said to me in primary, well look, the reason we focus on English and maths is because that's all you've got to look at. And that's what the accountab accountability measures really punish us for if we don't get them right. And I get both of those things. Uh, and this is a response to uh, that deficit or that criticism as much anything else. So for governors then, if you've traditionally been focusing on English, math, science uh, and maybe subjects where there have been issues in the past, then your focus will doubtless want to, to broad. I can't imagine too many governors don't have that broad focus already. So the impact of the talk curriculum outside of English, maths and science is going to be something we quiz governors about. How do you know how well pupils are doing in geography Example. Doesn't mean you have to track it, but we would expect you to know how well that's going. If a school is short in key stage three, we're really going to be looking at how you ensure there is that breadth in key stage three and what remains of it and in year nine. Uh, there's been lots out there on the internet <coughs> around that controversy, so I'll leave that one there for uh, today. EBAC, what are you trying to do to get towards that government target? That's in much sharper relief in the new framework. And the final point is about whether we'll look at data, those numbers on the page. Uh, of course, we'll be interested in what leaders tell us about their conclusions around the curriculum and how well they think it's being implemented, i.e. the impact. But what we won't do is try to get behind the numbers, look at the numbers in detail, and try to see whether we think you're right or whether we think you're not. Because you can't do that with the unit of resource we have in the time available. Three final uh, things just worth thinking about. 
Um, there is much more of an emphasis in this new framework than the old one on how well we do all the marvellous things we do and still ensure that staff are engaged with positively and their workload isn't insane. Uh, there are several bullets that look, look at that. This is not tokenism. This is really important for inspectors to get under the skin of. Personal development, a huge part of the new framework. Character development included within that, and there's the Oxford definition of it. We do recognise, of course, that in terms of character development, much of this happens in places other than schools. So we're not expecting schools in and of themselves to generate young people who have these incredible values, skill sets, experiences, but we will want to know what it is schools are doing to help young people with the same qualifications stand shoulder to shoulder with others who may have that polish, that confidence uh, that school has given them. And I did say that was the last slide, and it has just gone at 11. So firstly, thank you for bearing with me. Secondly, um, I'll hang around at break time, and anyone who wants to quiz me about things uh, is very, very welcome to do so. Thirdly, thank you again. I've served on four or five governing bodies. Thank you again uh, on behalf of Austin for all that you do. You are the unsung heroes of the education system, and nobody who hasn't been a governor has any idea of the extent and the importance and the demands of your role. Thank you.